As people, we love a party, don't we? Whether it's for a birth or for a death. And this was a death with a purpose. We pick up in Holy Week in an interesting place. If we follow it historically and track it in time, we have the triumphal entry last Sunday. Thursday night we have Passover and that wonderful occasion where Jesus so insightfully teaches his, his disciples there at the very end. First modeling for them what it means to be a servant leader, washing their feet when none of the others would dare take the role of servant. And he does a special work with Peter in that time. For Peter would have Christ wash not just his feet, but his head and his hands also. And Jesus establishes himself as leader of the disciples, even if he is taking a servant's role. Reminding Peter that if he's had a bath, all he needs is his feet washed. The translation for those of us in today's world would be, if you've been baptized, all you need is to have your feet washed. We take a bath, but the roads are dirty and dusty and filled with muck. We step in it from time to time. We make mistakes in our journey. And so Thursday night, we reenacted that to a degree. We had our foot washing, shared a common meal, although it wasn't lamb with bitter herbs. We did have unleavened bread and bread and soup and salads and shared in some readings of that event in Christ's life, in common confession and the communion. So Passover took place Thursday night, and Jesus, of course, after that meal, and during that meal even, spoke of the betrayer, the one who would betray him, and the dialogue that takes place. Lord, is it I? Is it I? And the answer is yes and yes. But Jesus is, of course, specifically referring to Judas. We know Judas's tragic choices and his tragic end, but the focus of the story isn't on that. The focus of the story shifts as Jesus goes to the garden to pray. From sweating blood to waking up to finding those who would pray with him asleep, again we find ourselves in the story. For Thursday night, we go home and sleep. Last night, we were able to do uh, what's called a tenebrae service in other traditions. It's a worship service in which we do readings from Psalms, Old Testament, New Testament, and Gospel, much as we do often here for worship, in which we focus on the light that has gone out of the world. As Christ said, it is finished. The world went dark. As Christ said it was finished, the light of the world was extinguished. You know the story. He was taken down from the cross. Though he was, because he was dead, his legs were not broken, as was the case with the criminals besides him, beside him. He was laid in the tomb of a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, and on Sabbath he rested. So we shift from a sort of historical tracking of all of this in our thinking to a different kind of thinking. And that is that we live in the present reality of the risen Christ and can celebrate that at any time. So the historical anomaly of tracking in time this event would be that Jesus rests on this day in the tomb and that tomorrow would be the resurrection morning. But if we step out of that tracking and step into the present reality, the truth of what has happened, he is risen and this is where you, the congregation, say, He is risen indeed. Let's try it. He is risen, he is risen indeed. indeed. So I have several passages this morning that I wanted to uh, uh, talk from, starting in Kings. It's worth turning to, 1 Kings 17. This takes place many years ago, 
the kingdom of Israel. Israel has had a series of very wicked kings, kings who have ignored the covenant of their fathers, ignored the God of Israel, and have turned to the Philistine gods and the gods of those that surrounded them. They've married non-Jewish wives who have brought their gods and goddesses and temple practices into the court. And Ahab is no exception. A wicked king who marries a woman we all know as Jezebel, and that's a term that's alive and well yet today. Elijah was one of the great prophets, we recall, from the Old Testament. The two greatest, Moses, the other Elijah. Moses, seeing death but raised from the dead, according to Jude, and taken to heaven. Elijah, taken to heaven without seeing death in the descending chariot of fire. Two incredibly influential prophets and two prophets after whom the Christ, the Messiah, is modeled. If we miss this, we miss so much of the connection between what's happening in the Old Testament and what's happening in the New. So we read of the story of Elijah who goes before Ahab and declares that there will be a drought of three years. He himself escapes to a place where there's a brook and is fed by the ravens, you may have heard this very odd story. So he lived there for a time. But it came time that the brook dried up, and God gave him new instructions in verse 7. Sometime later, the brook had dried up because there had been no rain in the land, and then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath, and when he had come to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. Now let's just pause in our story right there. This might remind you of a story told of Jesus. You see, Zarephath was not in Israel proper. It was ruled by Israel, but it was in the land of the Canaanites. It was in the land where all of these foreign gods were served. It was in the land where no man was permitted, Jewish man was permitted to marry. You also may remember that this trip to the well thing happens every time anyone is seeking a bride. When Abraham sends his servant to find a wife for Isaac, the sign is that she draws water for his caravan and for him, for their camels. And this is the girl that he ends up choosing for Isaac. And the story is repeated over and over and over at the well. It is here that men meet women that they will marry. Otherwise, they don't speak to them. Otherwise, they don't make these kinds of inquiries. So this is a a forward-looking example or story of what Jesus is going to do with the woman at the well in Samaria. He will speak to her and his disciples will be shocked. He will ask for a glass of water and it will be a very strange sign. So Elijah is the harbinger of this. He's the forerunner of this. He does this and asks bravely, will you bring me water to drink and a piece of bread? She, like the woman at the well, is astute, aware that he's an Israelite, a Jew, and that she is not. She says something very interesting. She says in verse 12, as surely as the Lord your God lives, not the Lord my God, The Lord your God lives, she replied. I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little of olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Times are tough. The lack of rain has taken its toll. There are no crops. There is no food. One must go and search, and one must prepare one's last meal. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. 
Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. I don't know if she knew her Bible. I don't know if she remembered the stories of manna daily or the provisions that didn't run out at the time of the exodus. But for whatever reasons, where you and I might be tempted to say, boy, this guy really doesn't get it. I'm going to go home and I'm not feeding him. I'm feeding my kid and then we will die. She didn't think that way. She heard what the prophet said and the promise, and she chose to act. She went away, verse 15, and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping of the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. I just love that. I love the way the Lord steps into a time of total deprivation and provides. Yes, it's basic, but it's sustenance. Jesus would say to the woman at the well, I have water, the source of which you do not know and don't understand. But when you drink of this water, you will never thirst again. And of course, the woman says, well, draw some of this water that I might drink not understanding what it is that Jesus is saying to her. Elijah is the forebearer of this, this story. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, "'What have you against me, man of God?' Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? I don't know what sin she's referring to. I don't know if there was a child out of wedlock. I don't know if she was referring to her status as a Gentile. I don't know if she was referring to the idea that so many ancients had that when bad things were happening in their household, it had to be as a direct result of sin. And she wasn't referring to anything specific in her life, just that God was punishing her in the death of her child. What an awful thought. Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms and carried him to the upper room where she was staying and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Now, I don't know what I would think if I were the Lord, but I would be a little insulted at the blame, I'm inclined to think. I would want to say to Elijah, come on, you know me better than that. We've journeyed this far. You've been my spokesperson, and really, you think I killed this child? What we do need to remember is that the concept of a devil was not well developed at 700 B.C., 800 B.C. So he cried out to the Lord, why have you brought tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die. Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. I imagine she went and bore witness much the way that the woman of Samaria went and bore witness to those that she knew as Jesus ministered to her. A resurrection story right here in 1 Kings. Elijah the prophet, a very odd story and yet a wonderful one, one that takes us to the possibilities of Easter, one that takes us to the joy of and the reality of, of resurrection life. Our second uh, passage today 
that I want to focus on is 1 Corinthians 15. Actually, I want to go to John 11 first. John 11. This is a story most of us know, the story of Jesus resurrecting his friend Lazarus from the dead. It contains the shortest scripture in all of the Bible, and if you haven't memorized it up till now, I would invite you to take the opportunity. It's John 11, 35. It's two words, Jesus wept. So if you uh, had never memorized a Bible text prior to today, Uh, Say it with me, Jesus wept. Now just keep that in your head and you have now memorized a part of the Bible. Uh, Now I would challenge you to work on your uh, four-word, six-word, ten-word, twenty-word, fifty-word, thousand-word passages. Um, Scripture is worth remembering and memorizing. You know the story. Word comes to Jesus in Bethany just a couple miles away. Actually, Excuse me, Lazarus and his sisters are in Bethany. Jesus hears word that Lazarus in Bethany has fallen ill. He's not far away, but he doesn't go to him immediately. He waits. Word later comes that Lazarus has died, and at that point he decides to go up to Bethany, even though he and his disciples were in trouble there not long before, and his life is at risk there. He goes there and sees that indeed his friend Lazarus is dead. He's greeted by Martha, Mary, I think, is angry and has stayed in the house, refusing to come out and greet the Lord. But Martha comes out and she says some amazing things. You know, there aren't a lot of stories in women in Scripture, but some of them are remarkably profound. We just read of one. Here's a discerning widow in Zarephath who recognizes the, the, the not only the religion of the man that she's seeing, but understands the reality of the God that he worships and puts her faith in him and his word as God's word and feeds him first. Remarkable. It's not, she's not incidental to this story. She's his hostess. He lives with her. He eats from her table. He's part of that family for a time. And now, Jesus, who spent so much time at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, is speaking to Mary, excuse me, Martha, and she says such astute things. Verse 21, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Wow. Well, it's pretty good. Martha has an advanced understanding of the way things are going to work eschatologically down the road. She knows that all things are possible for Christ. She knows that if he had been there, her brother would not have died. This isn't equivocated upon. She knows. This is a statement. She speaks it as a fact. She understands it as truth. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, that's a complicated sentence. I have a feeling were I seated at Jesus' feet that day or speaking to him on the road to my house, I would say, you're going to have to run that past me one more time, maybe twice. Could you repeat that, please? I have a feeling I would have to say, well, let's talk about that over some lunch. That's a bit heavy for right now. She says, yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who was come into the world. We make much of Peter's confession, don't we? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church. We make much of that passage. Peter said it, but who's saying it here? Martha. Martha. Her brother has just died, 
And she is uttering these profound words, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher's here, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could he have not? Could not he who have opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Sound familiar? Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. I can attest, four days of death in Palestine, it would be a bad odor. So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know or knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and seen what Jesus did put their faith in him, but some went to the Pharisees and told what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin, and as we all know, they plotted to kill him. Here in this story, we find resurrection hope yet again. Jesus resurrecting a friend of his who's died. These wonderful, rich theological pieces woven throughout this story with Martha and Mary. But we have a resurrection story. Jesus, the Elijah, if you will, has come. The prophet is there. And when he speaks, he's even greater than Elijah. When he speaks, a man not just dead for an hour or dead for a few minutes is resurrected, but a man who's been dead for four days. This is the Messiah. This is the Lord, creator God, heaven, creator God of heaven and earth. Paul will develop much with this in 1 Corinthians 15, and that's also worth a moment of our time. We usually review these texts when we have a funeral because we are commanded to com comfort one another with resurrection hope. But here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 15. I remind you of the gospel I preached to you on which you've taken your stand, the gospel by which you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I've received, I've passed on to you the first importance. Number one, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and the twelve, and after that appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and don't even, be deserve, don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. This is what you believed. Paul then goes into a big treatise about the resurrection of the dead. You've read it, and you've heard it. So how did these things come together at a time like this on an Easter weekend? What we need to understand is the following. 
The resurrection isn't something that begins with Jesus. It happens even before his time in the Old Testament. The prophet who forbears the Messiah-like coming is Elijah. And he, as a sign of his prophetic work and God's work in him, is able to raise one from the dead. Jesus will demonstrate in his own ministry and life the capacity to raise someone from the dead, not just once, but on several occasions. The most famous of which we've just read, the story of Lazarus. Four days in the tomb, longer than Jesus himself will be in the tomb, and Lazarus is called forth. Jesus prophesies about his own time in the grave. As it, I'll give you a sign, he says to this wicked generation. I'll give you the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And on day three, he steps forward. Paul will make the resurrection the center of his theology. First of all, because he's a Pharisee, and the Sadducees denied the resurrection. So Paul is, among other things, making a political statement. We all love to be right, don't we? Anybody not love to be right? Oh, come on. I know you better than this. You love to be right. And Paul likes to be right. He's a, fag- he's a Pharisee on the right side of this argument. Jesus has even spoken against the Sadducees about resurrection life. But Paul is going to make much of this because Paul understands this. When you die, you sleep. The body returns to dust. The breath returns to God who gave it. And what was living is living no more. If there is to be any kind of life with God, if there's to be any kind of eternity, it takes place because of resurrection. It takes place because God has breathed life back into body and created living being once again. Otherwise, wouldn't it not be sufficient for Jesus to have died and his spirit to have gone to heaven and lived on in that way? Otherwise, would it not have been sufficient for Jesus to simply tell the crowds, why are you crying? Lazarus is in heaven. He's in a better place. Otherwise, wouldn't it have made sense for Elijah to simply tell the widow of Nain, I know you're missing him now, but this is done because... Great things will happen for this child in heaven. No, not one of them speak this. Resurrection is the key. Paul comes back and says resurrection, life, starts now because of Jesus Christ. We're dead in our sins because we've been buried with him. We're alive in Christ because he's been resurrected from the dead. So your resurrection life starts now. This is Paul's argument, and this is what was meant in what Jesus said to Martha on the road. You know that difficult passage where I said I would need to talk about it over lunch or hear it two or three times. Our resurrection life begins here and now, and our hope of resurrection is our hope of eternity. We're Seventh-day Adventists. At least many of us here are. And an Adventist is one who believes in the coming of Jesus. Oh yes, we celebrate Advent. We believe he came in the flesh the first time. We believe he walked among us. We believe in the gospel stories and the miracles. We believe in the power of Jesus. We believe that he was before and is and is to come. We believe. But we also believe that he died that that death was for our sin, that he was in the tomb, resting, that he was resurrected from the dead, that there were many witnesses, according to Paul, hundreds of witnesses, not just a few, and multiple occasions, not just a single, that he's ascended, and that one day he keeps his word, I will come again and take you to myself. And if we've studied Paul's eschatology, we know that the dead in Christ will not be left behind and that we shall not precede them, but we will be gathered up 
with them to meet the Lord in the air when he comes. Without the resurrection, what we have is an interesting and weird and odd set of stories and beliefs. Without the resurrection, we have a strange hope and one not likely to yield much of anything except a lifestyle. Without the resurrection, we don't have life eternal because we all know that we are mortal and only God is immortal. And so I would suggest to you today, this time of joy and inspiration, this time of sadness and reflection, this time of journeying from the cross to the tomb to the empty tomb, that the resurrection faith and hope, resurrection life is key to understanding our faith. So if you're thinking about what it is that you believe, why is it that you're here, what is it about this particular church or this particular denomination that has resonated with you and brought you to this point in your experience, I hope today we can celebrate something common between us. He is risen. Oh, you almost had it. Would have been such a cool conclusion to this sermon, too. Something we all have in common. He is risen.